I'm skilled. Alright, um, so yesterday, guys, we, we, we started talking about how we factor uh, some equations that are greater degree than quadratic. So third degree, fourth degree, that kind of stuff. And there were there were a little couple special like procedures we had to do. We had to first make a recognition idea and say, okay, this one uh, I recognize as a GCF and all of it, so I can use this approach. Uh, or I recognize this doesn't have a GCF, but it's four terms, so I can factor by grouping. Okay. Um, here is another type of equation that we're going to have to do some recognition with. Okay. And that's the one thing I think people struggle with a lot in algebra is there, there's usually not directions in regards to how they lead you to the algebra, that it's all implied uh, rules, meaning they're kind of hidden. So they'll just say solve for x in this, but because the, the format, the development of the equation, they're understanding that, or, or they're uh, assuming that you know that because this is x to the fourth, and then you go straight to an x squared, and then plus a constant, but that's quadratic form, and then you can use your quadratic techniques, okay? It's kind of a, uh, an issue for a lot of students because we would like them to say in the direction this equation is in quadratic form do use substitution and then once you do that at the end remember a back substitute okay and those were probably words you haven't heard before but we'll talk about them here in a minute that would be awesome because then nobody's gonna get lost and not know what to do but directions are solved for x okay and the recognition and the understanding of the format provides you the implied rules for solving Okay. Um, and, and all of algebra is that way. And geometry is a little bit different, okay? but, but algebra is usually solved for x, simplify, evaluate. Those are usually the three types of directions you get. Um, and, and then you just have to play that game of, of being able to recognize. Okay? Uh, so throughout the year, we're going to try to build kind of a, a framework of, of, of what we're recognizing, what types of equations we're looking at, and then Okay, if this is a quadratic, here are the techniques. If this is a rational equation, here are the techniques. Um, and, and hopefully get better at that so that when we get to a, a calculus class, we're set for success there. Okay? So when we see this, obviously the, the headline here is equations in quadratic form. Okay? This is not a quadratic equation. This is a quartic equation because the power of four. Okay? Or if you want to call it a fourth degree equation, that's fine. But it's of quadratic form. And what we mean by that is that if I write down my quadratic form, I'm going to write it as ax squared plus bx to the first plus c is equal to zero. Okay? And I'm going to put another variable up here in my exponent. So I'm just going to, I'm going to use the variable u, like a w. Okay? The variable u. And, and that is the, the format that we see models quadratic form, okay? Because if it was just the two and the one, disregard the u's I put in there, would you guys agree that that middle term, the bx to the first, uh, the exponent is half of the exponent of the first term? One is half of two, right? Well, if I write it as one u, is one u half of two u? Absolutely. So what's nice about that is that when this turns into like a 3, and that's a 6, that's quadratic form because the 3 is half the 6, right? Okay. If it was, um, you know, 1 third, okay, if the exponent for my bx, so it was to a 1 third, and ax to the 2 thirds, okay, that's a 1 to 2 relationship, right? So we could use the idea that's in quadratic form. So as we go through these four examples, none of them are quadratic. Okay? Some of them aren't even polynomial. Okay? But we can use this format uh, in this little game that we're going to play to solve them easily. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do, when we recognize that's of quadratic form, you're looking at this thing, trying to figure out the, the, the process that we go through to solve it. Um, and then there are other techniques to solve this. They're just a lot longer and more complex. Okay, uh, very time consuming. Hopefully, we recognize that this here, that power, is half of that power. So the, the thing that you're going to do is you're going to take, and you have to write this stuff down. Okay, uh, especially when you get to a calculus class, because you might be doing this 
two, three, four different times within the same problem. And you're going to want to be able to keep track of things. Okay? So I'm going to say let u equal, now you let it equal just the variable, just the variable part of that uh, b term. Okay? So I'm just going to let it be x squared. Okay? I do not incorporate the coefficient. Does that make sense to everybody? Leave the coefficient alone. So if that's the case, then I'm going to write down here u squared. Okay? If u is equal to x squared, then u squared is going to look like this. It'd be x squared squared, wouldn't it? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay, replacing u now with x squared. So it'd be x squared into that power two. And that's going to evaluate what's a power to a power? How do we multiply it gives me x to the fourth, right? Did that produce, okay, an x to the fourth and an x squared through that substitution? Does that make sense? Or through that, uh, I guess we call this defining of our variables, okay? Now what I'm going to do is actually substitute. I'm going to come back into this equation, and everywhere I see an x to the fourth, we're replaced with u squared. Everywhere I see an x squared, I'm going to replace it with u. Now, would you agree that that blue equation is a little bit easier to solve or factor than that initial one? Okay? So once we have that, we should be able to factor that. That thing's going to factor to what? Okay, u minus 3, u minus 1. Okay? So then you know that u is going to equal 3, or u is going to equal 1, right? Okay. Now, a lot of people will stop there and think, I'm done. But the problem says we're dealing with x's, right? Okay, so I need to solve for x. Okay. So what we come down here and do is say that u equals 3, but what if we let u be at the beginning? x squared, okay? So this is what we call back substituting. We're going to basically put back in x squared here. So now x squared is equal to 3, and x squared is equal to 1. And at that stage, we're pretty close to being done, but again, we're trying to solve for x, right? So I'm going to take the square root of both sides, so give me x equals plus or minus root 3. And here this would give me x equals plus or minus root 1, which again is just 1. Those then would be my four solutions that when I plug back into the original, the left-hand side turns into 0, just like the right-hand side. Okay? Those are the places if I were to graph x to the fourth minus 4x squared uh, plus 3 equals 0, where we're across the x-axis. Okay? Um, kind of show you maybe how to do this on your on your TIA three or A four. We, we've spent time using Desmos and GeoGebra, uh, and hopefully you guys kind of pick up the the appreciation of those two um, calculators because of how efficient they are for you in regards to finding solutions. Um, the TIA three or A four obviously you have to use this on the ACT but it is in no way efficient. Okay? It is a very slow process in finding these solutions. So what we have to do first is we just type in, obviously in a y1, we're typing in our equation. So x to the fourth minus 4x four squared and then plus 3. Okay, uh, I'm going to you can hit graph, but I, I know my zoom is messed up, so I'm going to go to zoom 6, which is standard, which is kind of a, the default uh, basic um, zoom. It's 10 by 10. I see, actually, it's 20 by 20 window uh, from negative 10 positive 10 on both axes. Uh, and we get that little W, okay? And that's, generally speaking, uh, one of your three options uh, primarily for what a 
fourth degree polynomial will look like. Okay, uh, and, and there'll be a whole chapter dedicated to understanding that graph and that, that sort of thing. But what we just saw for guys, algebraically by hand, are where these, or where this curve passes through this x-axis, right? So I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and there's a, there's a tool on here that's pretty nice. If I hit zoom, and it's my first option, you've probably never used this yet throughout math, but it allows me to take my cursor, okay, and move it wherever I want to. I'm going to move it right there. I'm going to hit enter, and then start moving over and down, and it does kind of like a cropping process, right? Okay, I'll hit enter again. And now it will actually zoom in on that window. So that, that, that eliminated me having to go back in a second window, or sort of just window, and changing the x and y values as maximum and minimum. Does that make sense? So that's a, that's a nice tool to use. Uh, but what we are looking for then are these points of intersection right here. Four points of intersection. So this is how you do this. I'm going to show you how to do one of them. And you would have to do this four different times. You're going to hit second and then go up to the calculator, or calculate options, hit that. Now we gotta know what we're looking for, okay? And I've only got one equation written in there, so I'm gonna look for what we call a zero. A zero is asking you for x-intercepts. It's basically when does y equal zero, okay? Uh, zero is another word for root, another word for x-intercept. So we're we'll look for that one, two, okay? Now it's gonna give me my cursor, my cursor right now is up here somewhere. If you look at where it's located, it says 2.8 as a y value. That's one, so two would be up here. So my cursor's like right here where my arrow is. So I'm gonna start moving left so I can start seeing that cursor show up. Okay, so you see that cursor show up, right? I'm gonna try to find this uh, intercept right here. So you see where it says we're asking for a left bound. So basically what it means is can you find a ordered pair that is to the left of where you think your uh, intercept is, okay? So would you guys agree at that point it's probably to the left of my intercept? So I'm gonna hit enter. And then it's gonna ask me for a right bound. So then I'm gonna move to where I think would be to the right of my next intercept. And I hit enter, okay? And now what your calculator is gonna use is what's called the intermediate value theorem. And it basically says what you just did when you went to the left is that you had a y value that was negative, right? And now when you go to a right bound, you now have a y value that's positive, right? Well, somewhere in between a negative y value and a positive y value is what number? Zero. Zero. So it's going to search through all those ordered pairs that were between my left bound and my right bound. It's going to look for the one that has a y value of zero because it does exist in there. So when I hit guess, it's actually going to, it should just say like evaluate or something like that. I think it says guess because if it's irrational, it's giving me a rounded value. But if I hit guess, Gives me my solution of negative one, right? Okay. Now, if I want the other solutions of root three and negative root three and positive one, I got to go to the other x-intercepts and do that process all over again. Does that make sense? Okay. Where hopefully you see the benefit of something like maybe Desmos, where if I type that in as x to the fourth minus four x squared plus three. And now all I've got to do is click, put my cursor on the top of those gray dots. There's negative root three, there's negative one, there's positive one, there's positive root three, right? So much quicker. Um, again, though, for some reason the ACT is still stuck in the 1980s uh, and they want us to use the TI-8384, okay? Uh, you know, the TI-8384, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, the first guy that came out was like a TI-82, I believe. Um, and it was like the early 1990s, maybe late 80s, uh, that came out. And they have not changed at all. They, they've added color to them. Uh, they've made them look a little bit prettier. Uh, but what they do has not changed. And so I, I don't know why they're, they're still stuck on using those, but it probably has to do with money. Probably some TI has probably got some deal with them that says ACT, we got we got the royalties to the ACT. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Um, so you can use those tools to help you realize whether your solutions are right or wrong. Another way obviously to, to check your solutions is to 
always plug them back into the original equation, right? And see if you get true statements. Okay? Again, maybe a, uh, a task that is somewhat tedious or time consuming, um, but it will work. Right? Here's another one, okay? very similar. Um, we see that the x cubed term, okay, would you guys agree that that is half of the x to the sixth? Okay. So again, we're going to let that middle variable term be u. So we say let u equal x cubed. And you, you guys, I use u. It's just because when I get when you get to calculus, there's a process called u substitution. It's this, but you use it for other algebra. Okay. Um, it's just useful to use u. It gets you in the kind of that mind frame, and I'm just used to it. Okay. Um, it's, I believe a calculus too, you like integration by parts is the, is the area that you would use this uh, for the most part. Um, all right, so then u squared would end up being x cubed squared, right? Which turns into x to the six. So I've created my kind of my definition of my variables there. And now we can start substituting. Okay, so I'm going to have replacing that thing with u squared minus then 26 u because the x cubed becomes u, so 26 u minus 27 is equal to zero. Yes. Yeah, just. Because the, the only way that we can, the only other route that we have to factor that, if you remember from last year, you guys did the rational root theorem, you did P over Q stuff, kind of mentioned that maybe yesterday. That's the only other approach that we could use there. Uh, and, and that's kind of an ugly approach here because of how many factors 27 has. Okay, 1, 27, 3, and 9, right? Uh, now it's going to end up giving me probably close to eight different things that I would have to try. Um, and really all of that's going to provide me is possible uh, real solutions. Okay? So uh, it, it, it is, yes, getting us targeting uh, a sixth degree polynomial so that we can get it rewritten as a uh, second degree polynomial, you know, factor second degree polynomial using our, our uh, other techniques. And then when we back substitute it, it actually gets back into that sixth degree kind of form. Um, so when you get this, somebody in the last class used the quadratic formula, absolutely fine. But you find out that the discriminant is like 784 when you do that, and that's perfect square. Okay? So as they were doing that, I kind of watched it, and uh, it, it worked out to a perfect square. So then that should have been kind of an indication to him that, oh, well, there was a quicker, easier way to do that. Uh, what are the two factors here that we're looking at? U, U minus. 27 and u plus 1. Okay. Uh, so now, hopefully, we realize that then that's going to provide us u to equal 27 and u to equal 1, right? Sorry, negative 1. But what was u? u was x cubed. So I'm going to replace those. The only thing you gotta remember here is that you know, this, is just, this is very similar to the square root method. Okay, and solving for x eventually. You know, if it was x squared, you take square root of both sides, right? Well now x cubed, so what am I gonna do to both sides? Yeah, take the cube root. Okay? So then I get cube root of 27. Okay, so that can be rewritten as 3 cubed, right? So it just gives me 3. Okay. Now when I take the cube root. There is no plus or minus. So I take the uh, the odd root of something. Okay, so third root, fifth root, seventh root, ninth root. Um, I do not worry about plus or minus. And I can take cube roots of negative numbers. I can take odd roots of negative numbers. So negative one times negative one times negative one still gives me negative one, right? Okay. Um, so I take the cube root of this thing here. Cube root of negative one, like we said, is. Okay. Now, the next chapter, okay, or, or later on, it might not be in the immediate next chapter, we'll talk about 
how many times we know if those are solutions, okay? Um, because we can do some other algebra. We did it in last class because I think we started a little bit earlier than we, uh, and we had more time in that class than we had in this class. But um, we find out that there's actually two real solutions here. This thing crosses the x-axis twice, but it turns out that gives us four uh, imaginary solutions as well, okay? Um, and, and that's something we'll talk about. There's still four, sorry, there's still a total of six answers, uh, but four of them are irrational. Uh, if you plug back in here, okay, plug 3 to the 6th, minus 26, 3 cubed, minus 27, that should all evaluate to give me 0. Do the same thing with negative 1. Uh, and that's actually, if it's negative 1, that'd be positive 1, right? That's x to the 6th. Uh, then it'd be minus 26 times negative 1, so it becomes positive 26, so it's 1 plus 26 there. Minus 27, does that be zero? Yeah, okay. So substituting that one's not too bad. Uh, I'll have to check my solutions. Um, you guys know what time we got out here? 34. 34. Awesome. Not even polynomial nature here. Example three. X to the four thirds minus five x to the two thirds plus six. If we were to graph that, I'll give you a quick graph real quick just to show you how weird it looks, okay? Polynomials are always gonna be like a really smooth curve. It'll never be any corners or anything like that. Uh, they're always continuous, meaning there's no holes or gaps. Okay, but when we get this thing, okay, that is that. Um, Equation. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so that thing that's happening there, like zero comma five, we'll be verified that we call that a cusp. Okay. Uh, and polynomials never have those. Okay. Um, they're always smooth, continuous curves, and that's not smooth uh, right there. Okay. It's a jagged pointed edge. Uh, so not quadratic, however, not even polynomial, however. Some of our polynomial techniques will work once we make our substitution, okay? We see that, and, and this is something you gotta pay attention to because two thirds is two thirds half of four thirds. Yes, okay? Uh, a little bit harder for some people with fractions or rational exponents there, uh, but two thirds is half of four thirds. Um, so now, make that substitution. We're gonna let you equal x to the two-thirds. Okay, so u squared would be x to the two-thirds squared, which, again, power to a power, we multiply those, right? So that would give me x to the four-thirds. And again, the only reason I do that is to make sure that I do have something I can substitute x to the two-thirds with, and I do have something I can substitute x to the four-thirds with. Okay? Just validate and make sure that, that does uh, produce objects that can be substituted. So now when I substitute, x to the four-thirds is u squared, right? Minus n five, x to the two-thirds is u plus than six is zero. Okay. You guys should be able to factor that pretty quickly. U minus three, U minus two. So now U is three, oh. and U is two. All right. So if U is three and U is two, what was U? X to two thirds. So we really have X to two thirds is equal to three and x to the two-thirds is equal to two. All right? Now, here's our, here's where kind of understanding our algebra comes into play here in some of our uh, laws of exponents. We are usually solving for x to the first, right? I have x to the two-thirds. I need to get that two-thirds 
to become a power of one. Okay? How can I use laws of exponents to get that two thirds to become a one? Okay, three halves. Now, I'm going to take my three halves because it's three simple. So two thirds times three halves gives me one, right? What law tells me that I can multiply exponents? It's when we write them as a power to a power, right? Okay, I raise the two thirds to a three halves. That tells me you're going to multiply those two things, and that allows me to address and use that feature that reciprocals give me a product of one. So I raise that to two thirds gives me x to the first. That's awesome. But now I have three, and I got to raise that to the three halves as well, right? Okay. So now I got three raise the three halves. I don't like that answer written that way. And usually WebAssign or handwritten test is not going to like uh, answers that way. A lot of times they'll say, write your answer so no rational uh, exponents are left. Do you guys remember that if we were in Algebra 1, and then you talk about it a little bit more in Algebra 2, if I have A, I don't mark that word. Fabulous. If I have A to the M divided by N, you guys remember that that is N root of A to the M? Okay? Like 9 raised to the 1 half is the same thing as the square root of 9, right? Okay? Uh, so that's what we've got going on here. This 2 is the root. So this turns into the square root, and this is 3 cubed then underneath. Is that all right with everybody? So now you can do this one of two ways. Three cubed is 27, right? 27 is nine times three, correct? What's square root of nine? Three, so this is gonna give me three, root three as an answer. Now it's a square root, so I could have plus or minus there, okay? And that's the solutions that come from u equaling three and then substituting in my, my x to two thirds. Another way of doing that is to realize that, well, cube root of, or sorry, square root of three cubed is the same thing as this, which is the same thing as that, isn't it? And what's going to happen with that power of two and that root? They cancel to be three right to three, okay? So then when I do the, we do it over here in blue, when I do this one, it's going to, I'm going to do the same thing. So now it's going to be two raised to the three halves. So again, my... 2 is my root, okay, so I'm taking square root, and now it's 2 cubed, right? Well, what's 2 cubed the same as? 8, right? And what's the square root of 8? How does that simplify? 2 raised to 2. Rack of two. And again, it's going to be plus or minus. So if we were to go back to, uh, we're going to have Desmos. Nope. I have GeoGebra. If I go back to this, those four solutions there are the 3 root 3, the 2 root 2, positive and negative versions of it. Okay? Uh, keep working on that PDF I sent out. Uh, tomorrow's Friday.